there we go. Alrighty, so we are finally live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Costume Symposium and the panel on disability in costuming. My name is Melissa. My channel is So Biased, and you're already here, so you hopefully know that. And we are going to be interviewing six panelists, including myself, who are people with disabilities um, and who are also makers. And we're going to talk about the issues dealing with disability as a maker. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the CauseTube Symposium is happening all of this weekend. There is a link in the description to the playlist, and there are so many amazing videos you can watch. Highly recommend. Um, I've also set up a Ko-fi account, so if you want to donate to the panel as a whole, we are accepting donations. Uh, just please make a note with your donation that it's for the panel or for disability, and all the proceeds will be split amongst all of the participants as well as there are links to everybody's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Kofi, Etsy in the description. So please go and like and subscribe to all the wonderful people here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, fair warning, there's about a, a minute of latency between what we say and the time that you see it. So if you're asking questions, it'll take us a little bit to see it. Um, we're going to start off with a round table of people introducing themselves. So I will pass this over to Maya. You can go first. Hi, my name is Maya and my channel Maya Grace is where I work on historic costume, well, historic inspired costumes, fantasy inspired costumes and alternative fashion. Um, I have a background in theater costumes. That I don't really do much anymore. And yeah that's basically me <laughs> and do you want to talk about your disability at all oh sorry totally forgot that we were doing that this time around um yeah no i have um i have uh chronic migraine syndrome and a spinal injury and that affects me whenever i sew because if i'm not careful about my posture and how i'm planning out my spoons um my whole arm will go numb so that's me <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. Moving on to V. Hello, I am V. My YouTube channel is Snappy Dragon. Um, I can be found on other parts of the internet as either Snappy Dragon or at Miss Snappy Dragon if somebody already had Snappy Dragon as their handle. Um, I live in Northern California on the land of the Ohlone people. And on my YouTube channel, I do historical costuming, clothing, dress history stuff, research, um, various things of that nature. Uh, let's see, as for my disability stuff, uh, I have fibromyalgia, which basically means that um, it's not terribly well understood, but the best way of explaining it is my nervous system is constantly sending panic fight or flight signals to my entire body. And this causes a certain amount of, of, of wear and tear and, and problems. Usually that means um, fluctuating levels of muscle pain, fatigue, brain fog, um, not being able to wake up easily in the morning. So there's that. And then I also have, let me see if this works. Uh, I have this lovely situation going on in my spine. This is my x-ray that I had done in May. So I have that gigantic curvature in my spine. Nothing sits quite even, and that adds a lot of additional strain on my muscles. So that's fun. We'll close that down now. So yeah, that is basically the size of it. Awesome. So Isolde, you're next. Hi, greetings. Um, I'm Isolde. Um, I come from the history of the Society for Creative Anachronism, the SCA, um, where I'm known as Isolde van Lerkavenzida, which is a very Dutch name. Um, I'm talking to you from Wajak Noongar land um, in Western Australia, and I wish to acknowledge elders past, present and future on this land of which I speak on as well as to acknowledge that this land was never ceded and we all need treaty to move forward in reconciliation. Um, 
even though I come from medieval costuming through the SCA, Dutch 16th century, these days I do um, a lot of World War II vintage, which I wear a lot in my life as a librarian. So every single image you have of a librarian stereotype, I look like that, but I'm usually sitting in a wheelchair and telling kids to read graphic novels. Uh, I also do a bit, a fair bit of Regency in the last year. So lockdown has actually uh, expanded my sewing repertoire quite considerably. Um, I have Ellis-Danlos syndrome, uh, the hypermobile type. So lots of joint pain, wake up, and that part of my body is ouchy for today for no reason. Sometimes my hands don't work. Um, I use a wheelchair part-time. Um, which does really affect how uh, what I can sew because any kind of hoops, paneers or bustle, not happening. Uh, there's a bit of scoliosis in there and, yeah, just usual what part of my body is out to you today. So pacing myself is everything. Awesome. And huge props to Isolde, who is joining us from Australia at 2 in the morning. So... <laughs> Oh, it's three o'clock now. It's three so in the I'm, I'm okay. up a bit. <laughs> That's fine then. All right. Uh, how about Sarah? You go next. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Bent. Oh, here we go. I'm Sarah Bent. My channel is Sarah Bent. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to you from Nova Scotia, Canada, which is the unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, I've really been interested in historic fashion my whole life and only really realized within the last couple of years as CauseTube started that it was a hobby you could do. I didn't really realize that without a reason you could make stuff. Um, so that's a thing. Um, I have fibromyalgia. I have ADHD, which makes me talk like a, like a squirrel who's had too much sugar. Um, I also have depression. And I'm currently being investigated for a possible EDS diagnosis, so Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, but I'm still waiting to get into the, uh, what is it called? The soft tissue clinic at my, hot lo my local hospital. So we shall wait and see. Sounds awesome. And Violet. Yes, now it works. Hi. Uh, I'm Violet. I'm from the UK. I'm currently down in West Dorset, so southwest of the UK. Um, my channel is Adapting History. I do a lot of work on mostly adapting things so that they'll work with my wheelchair and with my disabilities because a lot of the um, <clears throat> a lot of the clothing and a lot of the methods that most people use don't work very well when things don't work in your body. Um, in one second, my wheelchair is just over there. So I'm a full-time wheelchair user. I have airless downless high for mobile type as well. Um, I have uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, um, autism, some mental health issues, uh, hearing and sight problems. <laughs> I'm just an absolute mess. And of course, everything sets off everything else. So most of what I do is just a bunch of adapting things and then making sure that I don't um, overdo it by planning too much. So, yeah. All right. And I guess I will go last. I am Melissa. My channel is here. It is so biased. Um, I live on the traditional unceded and stolen territories of the Kwekwetlam, Shtolo and Musqueam peoples. Uh, I primarily do 1940s costuming, uh, but I'm also an opera singer. And if I ever get to sing again, um, I also do some opera costuming and just haven't in a very long time. Uh, I have a mobility disability. I have a prosthetic ankle bone, which makes it very difficult for me to walk or stand um, and gives me chronic pain. So that is my disability. And... I think that's it. I think we covered it. So moving on to the first question, uh, we're going to talk about how your disabilities have affected you as a costumer. Um, would anyone like to go first on that one? No? Okay. I, I guess I will start on that one. <laughs> um, for me, 
Violet, you're still on mute if you're if you're trying to talk. Don't worry, I just said sorry, my brain has stopped. It is totally fair. Um, for me, my disability prevents me from doing a lot of events because I can't stand for a long period of time. I can't walk for a long period of time. So events like a lot of SEA things where you're, you know, in a park or something or walking tours or balls or um, even a lot of conventions because you're expected to stand and walk around the whole time. It's just virtually impossible for me to do even with pain meds. I can walk for about half an hour and then I have to stop for about three. So um, that's not really possible as well as for uh finding shoes that is difficult because i have to wear flats i cannot wear like a one inch heel is too much i will i will fall down um as well as trying to find um other other tools to use i have to sit down when i do most of my sewing so patterning and cutting is problematic and that's something i've had to find a bunch of workarounds to make work for me so who would like to go next or should i just appoint people Sarah. All right. So um, for me, um, I am kind of a recent um, ambulatory wheelchair user. So I do have a wheelchair for longer periods of time, but it doesn't usually live in the house. It lives in my car because it's pretty much for out and about. Um, but inside the house for, I struggle with energy levels, which I think is pretty much universal. When something starts to go wrong, you're using so much more of your energy just to kind of keep up with the day to day. Um, for me, ADHD also really comes into play when I'm sewing because I have a really bad tendency of jumping the gun and sewing two pieces together that don't belong together or forgetting a lining or in general, just getting myself into a bit of a headache that doesn't help anything. And then the energy level thing kicks in and all of a sudden I've got a mistake and no energy to fix it. So um, learning to plan out what I'm doing and taking it step by step is still, well, I mean, it's something I'm probably going to work on for the rest of my life, but <laughs> I do try. <laughs> there, who'd like to go next? Violet? Okay, I'll do it, it's fine. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Sorry, I was just glancing at the chat and got distracted. This is, again, my <laughs> wonderful brain. Um, so I use a power chair, so obviously that affects a lot of things because if a uh, place is successful, then I'm not going. And it also means that um, certain things within clothing can't be done. So as a soldier was saying, like bustles are just not an option and big hoops aren't either really. Um, especially as the arms of my chair don't really come off because they're attached to the um, controls. Um, so that's a big um, thing when it comes to actually going out and doing events like that. On top of that, we're, it's a lot of issues around dexterity um, and sight and the fact that I can't stand so I can't um, cut things on a table or reach over and do stuff like that means that everything has to be done on the floor because there is no easy way for me to be in my wheelchair at a table doing that. Um, but I spend a lot of time um, resting and a lot of time managing everything and doing everything bit by bit so that I don't end up in a situation where I've overdone it and now I can't do anything for two weeks. Um, and then on top of that, I have a ton of different adaptations I've done to make it so that I can actually feel out what I'm doing if I can't see it properly. I have magnifiers. I have um, I have the uh, electric uh, scissors that Melissa had put me onto, um, and just a bunch of things, all trying to make it so that I can get things done, so that then eventually things can go up um, on my YouTube. But it is completely an absolute exercise in working around whatever my body decides to do that day. All righty, who wants to go next? V, I think you had your hand up. All right, so I think one of the biggest things that affects my making process with the fibromyalgia, at least, is it's completely unpredictable. 
it's what's called a dynamic disability, which means it fluctuates in how much it affects me um, over time. So I never really would know what I'm going to wake up to as evidenced by this morning. I woke up to an extremely angry muscle in my shoulder and I've got a lidocaine patch on that right now. Um, and that's, you never know. It can be as small as like sleeping on something funny. Um, it can be something else. It can be from exertion the previous day, but honestly, it's just not predictable. So I have to have really flexible timelines in my process of like when I'm going to get something done or what I can do. I tend to have multiple projects on the go that require different kinds of work at the same time. So like I'll have a hand sewing project that I can do from bed. I'll have a project where I'm in the research phases of it. I can do that when I'm too tired to sew. Um, machine sewing stuff I used to do a lot more of. And over this past year, the sort of interaction between my fibro and my scoliosis has gotten severe enough that I've had to stop spending very much time at the sewing machine. So I actually try to keep that to a minimum because it just hurts more to be up and at the machine despite all the accommodations I've made for it so far. The other thing is um, because of the curve in my spine, making foundation garments that are like shaped like me as opposed to shaped like a symmetrical person is really difficult and is a long process. Like any of you who have seen my video on making a corset, uh, actually like two videos where I pattern tested and went through that whole process of making a corset that worked for me was very involved um, because I had to not only deal with the asymmetry, but also the, um, the fact that like fibromyalgia can be pressure sensitive. So if I have clothing that's putting sharp or not distributed pressure on me, that's gonna turn into pain in about 30 minutes. Um, the unpredictability also makes events um, very interesting, but I think we're going to talk um, a bit more in detail about events later, so I will save my, my thoughts about that for then. All righty, who wants to go next? Maya? Cool. <laughs> so I already kind of panicked and blubbed a bit of this, but like I said, um, I do get numbness from my chronic migraine syndrome and my spine injury if I'm not taking care of myself. Um, but another like huge thing that comes with my particular set of, of disabilities is that um, I have to plan ahead really, really far in advance because if I get like a knockout migraine that lasts for a long period of time, you know, I might lose a week and I don't get to choose when that week is it might be right before an event or during an event like when I did theater I had to get all of everything done or ready to delegate at any given moment because like I don't have control of when my body decides to do this you know it just kind of happens <laughs> that's fair and Isolde G'day, hold on, let me pull out my script so I can remember the notes I wrote months ago. Okay, so as I said, I've Ellen Stanlos along with some scoliosis. I use, I'm a part-time manual chair user, but I also mobility mobilize with cane and crutches, depending how I feel. Um, I get a lot of fatigue and along with the significant pain, but it does mean that pacing myself is so important um starting to have minor issues with the hearing as well but who knows what day it's quite uh like fibro eds can be quite dynamic um and when i'm planning it to attend events i also need to take into account my wife um i am a disabled carer which is something that often doesn't get acknowledged so my wife has autism, bipolar, and CPTSD. So I can't attend anything at night or in the evening after dark without organising a carer to be with her. Um, and planning weekends require us saving up support hours and missing support during the week so that we can arrange to have a support worker with her for three, four days straight because I won't be there. Um and like if I'm planning a camping weekend with the SCA, I will go ahead and book extra physio appointments um, the week following 
because I know how much pain I'm going to be in. And my last major camping event back in July, as June, my physio actually said that she'd never seen me so tight in the back. And what have you done? I was like, well, four days sleeping on a really crap mo uh, foam mattress along with wearing clothes that completely alter my posture because, as I'm sure if you know, many of you know, um, a lot of historical garments can affect the way your posture changes and the way you walk in them just through their construction. So um, all of that and it just screwed up my body in ways that she ha hadn't seen. Um, my wheelchair affects everything I do with clothing and I always know that at the end of an event, my skirts and my sleeves will always have dirty marks on them from the end of the event. So it, my disability affects every part of my attendance to events. Fair enough. And the next question, I think we covered most of, most of, most of, but I'll give everyone the chance to speak on it as well, is what barriers have you encountered as a disabled person when it comes to costuming? I think we covered most of it, but if anyone has something they want to add, please speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, I think the only one that really hasn't come up is that being disabled often impacts your ability to work for money, which impacts your budget for things. Um, finances are tight, always tight. Um, I'm also a single mother, so that also comes in. And yeah, some when you see people, oh, you know, silk is the only thing anyone should ever wear. And you're like, yeah, no, not happening ever. <laughs> it's just not in the budget. <laughs> But I mean, we also get into the situation where I don't know about anybody else, but I have to have disability benefits so that then I can get my care. But the amount of money that I have affects how much care I get, because if I have too much money, then I have to pay for all the care. And that can go way over budget, way too fast before they then adjust it again. So any money you do get, so I had a situation with inaccessibility problems with my university. I had to leave the university and then there was a whole legal battle and it was a whole thing. Um, but um, after that, I had some money left over and suddenly I had to get rid of this money very, very quickly so that then my ability to pay for my care wouldn't be affected. And so we end up with situations where you are really, really tight on money for like six months, seven months. Suddenly you get money, you have to spend it like that. And then you're really tight on money again. And people will judge you for being bad with money with it. But it's just the way you have to do it if you're going to survive as a disabled person. Because one month with too much money can mean ending up not having the care you need the next month. Someone just That's... mentioned in the comments, we need to exist in a sweet spot of just impoverished enough, which that's exactly it. Um, okay, so V, you're next. Um, I am, it's being told my call will end in five minutes. I'm gonna upgrade. So please ignore what's happening on the screen here. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, so what I always end up thinking is the biggest, I guess, barrier or limitation I run into is other people's expectations. Because oftentimes I like, the problem is not necessarily that I will be like, oh, I'm in my costume and my silhouette is different than the historical fashionable silhouette or that I look asymmetrical in my costume or that I have to change something about my costume in a way that most people would not have to like that is not inherently a problem the problem is how other people feel when presented with that and often that is people feeling entitled to judge or say oh well we have no evidence of people going around like looking asymmetrical in their corsets in the victorian period they would have wanted to look symmetrical and it's like well one it probably happened there just probably weren't pictures about it and two why do you think that people weren't having asymmetrical corsets that may have been more comfortable for them or having asymmetrical silhouettes or making those changes? Because ableism, because this problem of other people's expectations is not a new one. 
So that's kind of the the biggest barrier and frustration I run into. It's like just about everything else ends up falling into that sort of broad category of other people are having a problem with something that is not inherently a problem. Okay, and Maya, did you want to go next? Uh, yes, thank you. Along that same vein of managing other people's expectations, you know, I, I've i never done like very high level or professional theater. Like there's a lot of companies that I know I couldn't work with as a designer or as a costumer on, you know, in any role because I couldn't just dip out for a week if my health acted up. I can't commit to what they're expecting me to commit to. So, you know, it limits your options a lot, especially in a professional way, you know. When I was doing costume design, like to make a living while I was in college, most of who were commissioning me were um, like very small performers, like musicians or drag performers, and you know, big productions and big professional venues just really weren't hiring me for anything. I'm just going to make a note that just in case the call goes out, we will start the call again and rebroadcast. So. That's fun and exciting. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, do you attend historical or costuming events? Why or why not? And I know Isolde, you mentioned being a member of the SCA. So why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I came into costuming through the SCA. Um, and like when I joined the, joined the SCA, I could put a button on or uh, fix a fallen hem, but that was the extent of my sewing skills. So everything I have, I've learned over the last 10 years and it all stemmed back from the SCA, which is still a great passion of mine. And my attendance to events is, as I said, limited to how I'm feeling, how my wife's feeling, uh, whether we can get support workers to look after Sam while I'm out. Um, but I've got quite a few modifications that I use because a lot of um, SCA events here in Australia in Lockhart are outdoors in a field which for anyone that uses a manual chair <laughs> your wheels get bogged down and you cannot move over grass it is so hard to get a manual chair over grass and even though you know that the moment you ask other people to push your chair they'll jump to it doesn't mean you want to have to forever ask and you feel bad because at the end of an event the call goes out can everyone please help pack up and you're sitting there going uh sorry can't and you never turn up early to help with the voluntary side of things so I've learned had to learn how to manage that one of the other things I've recently got is I um, applied for funding through the National Disability Insurance Scheme I, I'm going to inter interrupt you there just because the call is about to end. So I'm going to stop the stream for a second. I'm just going to pause it. Yeah.
Oh, sorry about that, everybody. That is a big pain in the butt. I do. Are we back on you, stre streaming on YouTube yet? I yeah, we are. <clears throat> Excellent. You okay. Put your captions back on one sec. Oh yeah, turn captions on. Sorry, folks. Yeah, um, Melissa, do you want to let the good people know what just happened and how you fixed it? Um, I didn't fix it. Uh, I just started a new call. Apparently, okay. Google, Google Meet has a limitation of a certain amount of time, and then it just shuts off the call, which I did not know. And I have to join Google Workspace, which the only way I could have done that was by entering my credit card on a live stream. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, it might be a bad idea. Yeah, we, we never stopped streaming, by the way. Everybody saw the... Um... I know. I, I had to. Otherwise, I'd have had to start a new stream. Yeah. It that, makes... was, that was the only choice. So sorry, folks, about that. That was unexpected. Could I so... quickly show off something awesome? Sure. So um, one of the things I got funding th through the National Disability Insurance Scheme is I explained that at my medieval events, everyone's using nice wooden or uh, forged cutlery at the dining table as part of their feasting gear. But I had beige colored giant plastic handled things so that I could grip properly. So I got funding for one of my, the local blacksmith knife makers to make me these uh, walnut um, and forged sets of cutlery with their um, ergonomic grip handles um, that he copied off my uh, commercial set. And this is all hand forged, handmade, and I'm loving them so much. I haven't had an event to try them out yet, but I have these awesome cutlery. And when the guy put them on his own YouTube and it says uh, making a set of uh, historical cutlery for someone with a disability who needs ergonomic cutlery, all these uh, blade makers and knife maker fans jumped in saying, that's not historical, that's not historical. Where in history do you have evidence of this? And was, he'd clearly said it was for someone with a disability and it was in the vein of historical-esque because this person didn't want to use plastic cutlery at the dining table. But everyone was getting so judgy at him for making handles that looked like that. I couldn't believe it, but that set of cutlery has changed my SCA experience for me. That's awesome. I can I've imagine. Only had them a week. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. That's um, I'm really lucky with my annual wheelchair because I have a, my eldest son is 14 and has is on the spectrum and finds it very reassuring to have a central place in the group where he's best supposed to be. So he has taken over all pushing duties. So I essentially have a powered chair. It's just kid powered. I don't have to push it. I just have to sit in it and I'll be like, I'm fine. And he's like, no, 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 I got it. Because he, he doesn't like the feeling of being, apparently he'd been really missing when we, get, when we gave up the stroller from my youngest, because if there's a stroller or a wheelchair or something, that's the middle of where the group is. And apparently for him, he finds it really hard to kind of judge where the boundaries are otherwise. So he really yeah. enjoys having the wheelchair because that is where he's supposed to be. It gives him purpose. Exactly. So I have been very, very lucky. I also got an amazing wheelchair <laughs> for free because of the insurance I happen to have through my job at the time. So I've been extraordinarily lucky. The, the wheelchair cost more than my car at the time. Wow. Yeah. Does anybody else, anybody else want to share their experience with events? I think the last time I went to an event was when I was still walking. So we're talking over seven years ago at this point. Um, I was about 16, 17. Um, but it really does depend on when things are. I mean, I've had a big problem with a lot of the time that I've been um, really publicly doing historical costuming and sewing and stuff like that has been during a pandemic and I'm a disabled person with some serious health issues that could be heavily worsened if I got COVID. So I have been mostly in my house for the past couple of years at this point. Um, 
on top of that, I have chronic fatigue, so I'm usually mostly in my house. Um, so, but uh, I mean, I've I really enjoyed uh, Coco Vid last year just because it kind of had that weird feeling of like being in something with everybody while not having to try and do all the logistics of going out and actually getting um, all of the stuff sorted out, trying to work out how to travel when you've got to use a wheelchair accessible vehicle and wondering if there was disabled um, parking and then getting my wheelchair into places, asking if there were disabled toilets, it's a whole thing. Um, And so if if I'm in a situation where um, I know all of that stuff is like sorted out, I used to do this when I was doing uh, work with the Green Party in this country. Um, I would make sure that everything was set out so I knew there was a toilet, I knew everything was there. Then I might be able to do events, but that just hasn't come up at this point because of the whole COVID stuff happening straight as I had to leave my university because of accessibility issues. It just all happened to all come at once. I did have one that I had written down. Um, I do a lot of camping events. They're not like formal costuming events, but you can get dressed up while you're there. Um, And the last one I went to, the camping area was quite apart from where the kind of the main field is. And the walking back and forth was just absolutely brutal. Um, It was too rough for the wheelchair. And in the end, my poor kids ended up having to just like run and fetch and run and fetch a lot. Um, But we were able to talk to the owners of the land and they had said, well, we have this little cabin on the field that nobody really uses. Next time you come, by all means, please camp there. So by bringing up the issue, we were able to kind of find a solution because otherwise I was like, I don't know if I can do this again because this is nuts. Oh, yeah. Also that weird thing. Sorry. I'm, I mean, sorry, sorry. I, I mean, I was just going to say that the powered wheelchair side of things does not help. It's just the same. Yeah. Um, and the thing that drives me the craziest is when you go to any kind of thing where you're like, okay, I have my chair, I have my drink, I'm all, we're all sitting here and we're talking, and then everybody gets up and moves somewhere else. Because for them, it's no big deal to just go over that way, and you're like, I just got here, guys. Come on. Anyone else have experiences they want to share? B? Oh boy, I can say some words. Um, So I am, to my misfortune during COVID times, I am a massive extrovert. I love events. I love particularly like working and performing at events. Um, I did Dickens Fair, which is a local sort of uh, 1840s through 60s, um, not quite reality, but close enough um, historical fair in uh, my local area. And I loved it. But like trying to deal with event management as a disabled event performer is an absolute nightmare. Um, A lot of the events don't have any sort of don't have any sort of protections for disabled participants, volunteers, workers, whatever you would want to call us, Um, even though they should be required to, but they've already done all sorts of sketchy nonsense to get around uh, classifying us as volunteer employees. So that essentially sort of lets them out of a lot of ADA stuff as well. I don't use mobility aids. So a lot of the sort of like uh, more material issues didn't come up for me, but Like I know somebody who was refused the use of a disabled or an accessible parking space because he was working the event. He was crew rather than a customer. I know somebody who hurt her ankle during the run of the performance and was told by the costume department, you have to provide a historical looking cane for yourself to use. You can't come in here with a modern cane and we're not going to provide one to you not even on a loan basis. We don't have that in the costume shop. And even if we did, we would make you pay to use it. So that's just ridiculous and unacceptable. And I can't even imagine what these managers would do when presented with a wheelchair user, because I am actually struggling to think of any people in the cast or crew I know that use wheelchairs. And, you know, you wonder why. But also as a ten, even as attending an event, the, the problem that tends to come up is you sort of have to, if there is accessibility stuff, it's often very like separate. So it's like, well, you can participate in the event or you can have your accessibility, pick one. 
And that's just not how it should work at all. Yeah. Uh, Courtney just mentioned in the chat of accessibility and uh, mobility aids should be invisible by mutual consent is if you see them, you do not comment on them. Obviously that person needs them. I don't make you not wear your glasses. I don't check that you wove the fiber yourself. <laughs> you can deal with the fact that I have a cane. I mean, here's the thing. Dickens Fair will make you not wear your glasses if they don't look historically plausible. Like I can't wear these. I have actually like a little round metal framed pair of glasses that live in here that I wear um, when I had to do Dickens Fair because I haven't figured out contacts yet. So yes, they will make you not wear your glasses. Don't be that person. Don't, just don't be that person. I would absolutely be out just on the glasses alone, even if it wasn't for my wheelchair, because I can see less than an inch without my glasses. And my lenses require thicker frames to be able to hold them. And so I literally wouldn't be able to wear thinner, the thinner wire framed glasses without the lenses just popping out. Yeah. Which kind of transitions us nicely into our next, oh, sorry, uh, Maya, did you have a comment? Oh, I was, no. Okay, you looked like you had, okay. Um, so it, we kind of segued very well into the next question of what do you wish event planners and organizers would know about making an event accessible? And I know we are all ready for this. So <laughs> who, who wants to take the first crack at this one? Sure, I'll go okay. ahead. Let me bring up my notes. Uh, um, some of us do need a carer, support work, interpreter. And as a result, I become that person's employer. They are my responsibility to pay their ticket too. You, you don't go to work and expect um, to have to pay your ticket to entry to get into work. But this actually adds on to the cost of for the people with disabilities. Um, an example of this is within the SCA, if I bring a support worker to an event, I need to pay for their ticket to the event plus non-member insurance, which in Australia is an additional $10 per event. Um, and this is required by the SCA's insurance provider. But I already pay workers insurance to my employees, which is required by law. So my employees covered by insurance twice over and that's something we haven't quite solved at and we really need to it's being elevated up to kingdom level to try and sort this out um because being disabled is seriously expensive even when you have really good um disability support and funding um in australia we've got the national disability insurance scheme which is only 10 years old and provided you can navigate the bureaucratic bureaucratic mess that it is, can fund almost anything you need. I, it has changed my life. Before the NDIS, I had zero support for either myself or my wife. Since then, I've got new wheelchair. I've got uh, an electric scooter attachment. I suddenly can get all the Epsom salts and heat patches I need um all the electrolyte drinks i need if i go oh my oh that splint's looking a bit tatty i can just go and buy one and it's all covered and when pandemic started and everyone's racing to get indoor exercise equipment um <clears throat> and my i was facing two weeks inside where if i don't exercise in a certain way i stiffen up and i'm in agony all that expense of buying fit balls and dumbbells and yoga mats and stretchy bands, I could get covered by my NDIS policy. Um, I've got support workers. I get support workers to go up and um, uh, they come with me to events and set up my campsite so I don't have to uh, set up my tent, exhaust myself for the whole event and not participate. Now I can just go and camp without having to set up my tent or pack it down because my support workers do that for me, which is awesome. <laughs> it has changed my involvement. But the SCA's insurance doesn't really allow for that. And at my most recent camping event in June, technically my support workers didn't enter the site at the beginning and end of the event 
because otherwise I would have had to pay day insurance for them twice over, which was $10 a pop plus the ticket. So officially, they, they didn't come on site. They, they didn't come on site officially. But I they were still covered by insurance because they came under me. So it's making things access, financially accessible for people with disabilities. And part of that is not charging the cost of a support worker, carer or interpreter. Yeah, and it's something I've seen a lot of too. When I've asked people about inclusivity, they're like, oh, we have never had disabled people at our events, so we've never thought about it. I'm like, no, that's the opposite. You haven't thought about it, so you don't have disabled people at your events. Like, you're, you're And getting I've got a great, great example of how that follows. I was going to include it later, but um, you've, you've brought up that adage, so I might as well put it here. Um, when I joined my local SCA group, sometimes they'd have events that weren't accessible, and but I, I was still clambering around on the crutches, so we may do. But over time, as my disability worsened and I got in a wheelchair, the organisers made events, made efforts to make it more accessible, and they stopped taking um, events where there was no toilets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here we are, ten years later. And at that recent camping event, um, I'm going to share this, um, a window, for an event of just 120 odd people, we had four wheelchairs and a walker at that event. I have never seen so many wheelchair users at an SDA event before. And it was so amazing and all these individuals have given permission for this image to be in social media and it was so exciting um for those that don't know that's me in the middle grinning my face off but um we we've come so far from oh we don't have any disabled people to oh we've got to make sure that susie can access to everyone coming because they know it's an accessible place and it's been absolutely wonderful to see that transition yeah. and advertise it tell them what measures you've taken so that people are like oh i could actually go to this because i i know from myself i often just assume i can't because nothing's been mentioned um, yeah also they forget we talk to each other yeah. like, if disabled, <laughs> like if disabled people have a really bad experience at your event they're telling other disabled people and warning them off that event if they mention that they're considering it. They're saying, oh, just to be aware, they don't have disabled toilets. And when I asked if I could use the building's disabled toilet, they told me that I would have to pay extra or they don't have a ramp in there. I paid money. They didn't tell me in advance. I got there and couldn't get in. Like people will talk and we're pretty vocal to each other because it's so much effort and energy and other people don't necessarily look out for us. Mm -hmm. So we all end up putting in that effort to go, oh, you're a disabled person, you're one of us, and I'm going to warn you about all this stuff that I know that you might come across. Mm -hmm. And even aside from actual events, even places like, um, I was to the Halifax Citadel, which is a national park, like owned by the government of Canada this week, which therefore should be accessible in as many places as they can make it. Um, one of their ramps was literally just boards. One of the boards brought it off and it took three people plus my kid to get me back on the ramp and up through it so that I didn't like fall out of my wheelchair and die. Like, which I did tell the information center and she was like, yeah, we will get that fixed right away. But still, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Again, like, this is a doing national park. Yeah, this is a national park. This shouldn't be in it. Like I expect this at a little like tiny society owned museum somewhere, but national park. I paid eleven dollars to get in. Absolutely. I mean, I studied law, That's so ridiculous. we went to um, we went to Parliament at one point and to the Supreme Court. Neither of those places are accessible. Like you can get in the front door once you get to the House of Commons. Okay, you can't get in. Like you can get like five like five centimeters to the door <laughs> and then it's too narrow for a wheelchair to get through like the um, supreme court there's steps all over the place there are only certain areas you can get in like we're not going to have disabled lawyers and judges and politicians who are going to be able to do like prominent things within our country because even at the highest levels we don't have basic accessibility like you just can't fit a wheelchair in there 
Absolutely. And again, it's history taking precedence over disabled people being able to access it. Because the whole reason those places aren't accessible is because they're like, oh, well, we've kept it exactly as it was historically for this whole thing. And it's like, you could sort of half the difference and just go, we'll keep this area, except do this and make you have a nice big accessible area right here where you're still visible and you can still take part and have your history and still have us be able to actually get in the door. Yeah, remember when yes. certain buildings had signs that said certain people weren't allowed in? We didn't We didn't leave those up because it was historically accurate. We took them down because it's a terrible thing to do, you know, in most places. Like, don't yeah. be- In terms of accessible parliament, Australia had that same problem when a few years ago, we suddenly had a uh, Australian senator who has cerebral palsy. And not only did they need to make building modifications, they had to get him a new wheelchair because uh, of the timer to vote. He had to be able to get from one end of the room to the other in time to vote. Um, they had to change the official standing orders <laughs> um, because in the Australian Parliament requires people to stand to vote. So they had to change the official standing orders so that he could vote and speak from a seated position. I'll actually find a link about all the modifications the Australian government had to make for um, Jordan Steele John, who's actually a friend of mine in real life. So it was um, wonderful that he actually um, came to power and has since retained his seat. Um, so I'll find that a link about that and I'll put it in the chat in a minute. And. For, for me, the biggest thing is seating is I am not, I have, I was a wheelchair user. I'm not really now, but there's two kinds of seating you should include at any event. One is the quiet area where people can just go chill out where there's no music, no hubbub, especially for people who are neurodiverse and need the opportunity to just kind of unplug and, you know, or introvert out but also seating in the middle of things. Like if you're doing a big fashion show where everybody's walking, if you're doing like a big dance or a gala, there needs to be seating that is available right where things are happening. Otherwise, I've seen plenty of like ballrooms that have chairs like along one wall on the opposite side of the event. And it's like, well, I can participate and be in pain for half an hour or I can just isolate myself. And that's- And I'm gonna add to that, sorry. No, it's all right. And I was saying I that seating to... should be reserved. Like it should have signage yeah. that says it's not just for random people. This is reserved for people with disabilities. And it should be seating that has a back. Yes. Because I don't care. Your bench is a nice thought, but at the same time, I'm going to sit on that for half an hour. And like the whole of my back is just not having it. Yeah. Seating is so important for me. And if you're doing like a walking tour, like, can you space it out in like small increments? Oh, we're going to tour this portion of it for half an hour and then do a seated activity. We're going to do this portion for another half hour and then do a seated activity and, you know, have the ability that people can participate. Someone even suggested the idea of having there are uh, cane chairs or even little collapsible chairs that you could like. Someone's coming. You can sign one of these out and not even just for people with disabilities, people with young kids, people who are just tired or old or very young like those are great ideas to have little folding chairs that people can sign out with their ticket please don't make us pay for them because as a planner you should do that um so that we can just take them out and be able to sit oh we're going to stop and have a lecture for a while plunk down in the chair perfect yeah one thing um that i do want to sort of like so I've been, I've been to events that are more costuming focused but i'm also um, very involved in my local social dance community and while we haven't exactly had dance events for a little bit because COVID, one thing that I've noticed at a lot of the social dance events I've been to, historical and otherwise, is they seem to have a little bit of a better situation of this figured out, the seating thing, because what they'll do is like, you'll have this, this ballroom, this dance space, and then along the, every edge of the dance floor that isn't occupied by a door or a stage, there are just chairs, usually with backs lined up right near the dancing right near the music in the same room and people will sit down in them for all sorts of reasons just because they're not dancing at the moment or whatever so something that you'll see happen a lot of the time is somebody sits down and then their friend will just come and sit down next to them because they don't have anything else to be doing and then suddenly you'll have this whole like assembled group of people because one person needed to sit down and they're still able to participate in the event and listen to the music and watch the dancers and be there in their outfit 
and they don't have to leave the room, which is wonderful. And that's sort of like my my ideal for how I want to see accessibility be part of events is like, don't don't think of it as like this add on. Don't think of it as like this separate thing. If you're organizing an event, work it into the normal flow of the event as much as possible. It should not if you're doing it right, you shouldn't be feeling like you're interrupting or changing event. You're just making it part of it because then what happens is the disabled people who need the accessibility, they don't have to separate themselves out. It's already hard enough to take part in events when you're managing your disability and without managing all of the challenges placed in front of you because of your disability. Don't make somebody separate themselves just to get access to those accommodations they need. So like the number of times when I have been really grateful that like, okay, I'm tired, something hurts, but like I'm having a really good time and I still wanna be here getting my extrovert time in that I can just sit down in one of those chairs at like the side of the ballroom and the dancers are like 10 feet away from me and my friends will just sort of start sitting down and visiting me anytime that they're not dancing. So I don't have to leave. I can still be there and have a good time. But it's the difference between making it a thing and it just being there. Like if I have to sit, if I have to go through, go up to somebody, go and go fill out a bunch of forms and do all that sort of stuff to request like a caption thing at a, a film theatre or to request that you put down a ramp for the bus or something. Now you've made it a thing and that's going to make it much harder for me to do all that stuff. It makes everybody immediately have to stop. You have to take time out of your day. Everybody else has to stop what they're doing so I can do it. If you put that stuff in so it happens automatically, or so it's just uh, if you need captioning stuff, just come here, pick one up, or the ramp comes down automatically for buses, then suddenly it's not a thing. You're not holding anybody up doing it, and everyone gets to benefit from it. And it makes a massive difference. So if you're doing accessibility stuff, trying not to make it a big thing makes a big difference to how many people are going to then choose to access that, especially if they're not visibly disabled. Because a lot of the time, if you're using something and you're not visibly disabled, it's almost always able-bodied people who do it. You suddenly get people going, oh, well, you shouldn't be using that. Why are you going into the disabled toilet? And it's just they're like, you don't look I'm disabled and they can go if they need to use that toilet for whatever reason you don't know if they've got Crohn's or any other invisible disease like that is something that they might need for any number of reasons yeah just the the number of people who are like excuse me do you want me to walk around with a sign on me that says like with a picture of my x-ray like what exactly what exactly would you like you need to put the handicap placard like, around your neck. That game. I mean, once I get one, I just might do that. <laughs> just wear it as a <laughs> necklace. Yeah, no, my very favorite comment I get in like malls and stuff, you're too young to have a cane. I didn't know there was an age limit. Yeah. Like, what do you want me to do, buddy? The I mean, number of people. I can't stand. I've had people tell me I'm too young to be in a wheelchair. And I'm just there like, it's a genetic yeah. condition. Like. I had this when I was a baby. It's just gotten worse over time. You can't be too young for a genetic condition. It's a great. I'll just yeah, get the, up and the, walk the number then. Of people who, the number of people who have told me, like, I'll tell them about my symptoms and describe it and be like, oh, yeah, there's the muscle pain and the fatigue and the having trouble getting up in the morning. And they'll be like, oh, that sounds like being old. You're too young to be experiencing any of this. And maybe what they mean is... It's, it's frustrating that somebody who has no other reason to be experiencing this is having it. But what it really comes off as is I am dismissing, like, I don't think you should be experiencing what you're experiencing. I'm dismissing it. I think you're lying. I think you're playing something up. And just like, just, just don't say that to people. If somebody tells you about their symptoms or their medical state or their disability about or anything, the appropriate response is great. Tell me what I can do to make your life easier. Just that. Don't stop there. Don't tell me that when I get out of the disabled parking and I'm not using my cane or wheelchair that day, don't go telling me I'm not allowed to use my grandma's parking permit because I will not be too impressed with you. Oh, I'll call you out. I have called people out because 
I've been in the military for 22 years and I've had the moment, especially when I was in the wheelchair, went up to an elevator and people were rushing ahead of me to try to get to the elevator first who were like running and were obviously able-bodied. And I stood there looking at the full elevator and in a very loud voice was like, can all the able-bodied people get off the elevator now? And you could see people just sheepishly like, don't, don't do that. Don't be that person. Yeah. Yeah. So another no. thing that's, uh, that just occurred to me is like, sometimes it's really, really nice to have other people around who can do that. Um, Isolde was talking about like bringing care workers to events. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm not in a position where I have access to actual proper care workers. Um, I rely a lot on emotional support humans, which is a concept we talked about during last year's disability panel. But it does... Um, it does really make everything easier when I have somebody who's with me where it's like, okay, if I'm having bad pain, I am probably like, I, my pain will sometimes spike to the point where I describe it as I can't string two thoughts together. Like you want me to talk in complete sentences when I'm in this much pain. And that's like just talking in complete sentences at all, not talking in complete sentences enough to describe what's going on, what I need and how it should be provided to me to somebody who may or may not have any idea what they're talking about and what to do about it. So having another person with me to do that is really helpful. And so this is maybe less of a thing for event organizers, but certainly more of a thing for like, if you're going to an event with somebody who has something going on, um, it's it can be a, a really big deal for that person to have somebody who's familiar enough with their needs to just like, okay, you can shout, hey, all the able people get out of the elevator. Yeah. And then I don't have to do that. Or for somebody else to say, hey, is there a place where V can go lie down for a bit? Yeah, have advocates. Yeah. So I don't have to try to figure out how to do that while you're having like a massive pain flare. People need to listen to their advoc those advocates. Like they need to be aware that some people need an advocate. Um, I'm pretty good at advocating for myself. I have a, I guess, a physical support for human in terms of my older son who does set up my campsite, <laughs> break down my campsite. But he prefers that because he'd like to not have to go talk to people if he can get away with it. So <laughs> yeah. it works out. So I'm going to sum up a little bit and then move us on because I, I know we spent, a, I know we are very passionate about this and I am also passionate about this. <laughs> oh, um, one thing I forgot to say oh, was sure. uh, please make things wide enough for wheelchairs to get through if you have a bunch of chairs and they're too close together. I can't go through there. Including turns. The turning part is some yeah. of the hardest. Moving straight through is fine, but if it's a wide staircase or wide opening next to another wide opening, that may not be enough to actually make that turn. Yeah. You need to do the my, three points. My wheelchair is longer than it is wide, so I might be able to get through there, but once I'm turning, it's swinging around. Yeah, and there are reclining chairs as well for people who can't sit that are much, much longer. They can be, you know, six, eight feet long, so like more than two meters long for some people. Um, so sum up what we talked about. Um, think about all aspects of accessibility. Make a list of them on your website. Here are all the things we have available. If you need them, let us know. Like if you're going to do captioning and you have like an audio device, say, here's something we have available and like a check-in place that people can say, oh, I'm here for the collapsible stool, the captioning device, the extra cane, the whatever it is, you know, maybe have people wear like a badge of some kind that doesn't say handicapped or like a ribbon just so that they can access things or know who to, and identify people they can talk to for accessibility needs, um, as well as knowing what things you can't address like some historical homes can't be renovated in such a way but be very clear about that of there is accessibility through the door um but only access to the first floor and no wheelchair accessible washroom like we know that like we know that that's a thing that happens but we, you need to put it be very clear about what you can and can't do um, put it as, on the website please don't make me call yes please put it on the website please make it very easily accessible for anybody who wants it, because we're making our decisions whether we go to your event based on that information. We're most, I'm not gonna take the time to call you to see if I can go or not. Um, as well as put disabled people on your planning committees. Every planning committee you have should have at least one person with a disability because my disability is solely mobility based, but I'm gonna know about accommodations for people who have sensory issues or you know, visual impairment, hearing impairment. I know that most people with hearing impairment don't use ASL and most people with visual impairment can't read Braille. 
you may not know this. Oh yeah, okay, my mic is cracking. So I have terrible Canadian internet, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, put us on your planning committees. We will help and put it in the budget to have these things available. They don't all cost a ton of money, but even the able-bodied people will appreciate it. Being able to sit down, being able to chill out, being able to you know not be on their feet all the day will make your events a lot easier on everybody. And it's not going to be, oh my God, I went to an event. Now I need to sleep for two days. So moving on is what barriers have you encountered when trying to buy costuming supplies? So who would like to start with this one? Anybody? Sarah? Um, I, my biggest one is going, is my local fabric store is crowded and I can cope with that, but then you have to take this whole bolt of fabric and carry it up. And if you want more than one, you have to carry all of them at the same time up to get cut, or you have to make six trips, neither of which is terribly practical. And it's just infuriating because they're like, no, you can't leave here. No, we don't have cards. No. And you're just like, well, then what do you want me to do? Because I can kick it along the floor. But seriously, I got a, I got a little mad. <laughs> Please kick them along the floor until they get cards. Just do that. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? V? So this is, this is actually a slightly more recent development in my life. Um, so I never learned to drive for non-disability related reasons, but now because of some of the medications I'm on, I medically cannot drive. I will not be able to learn. I cannot safely operate a motor vehicle. And that causes problems because that means I have to do basically the majority of my fabric shopping online unless I either can walk, take the frankly terrible public transit that exists in my American town or get somebody to bring me, which so then it's like if i'm looking for something specific it's likely to cost me more i'm not able to go and like take advantage of it in person sales i can't go and get swatches um so that's definitely a bit of a barrier and i mean it applies in other areas of my life too like not being able to drive in a country like america that runs entirely on cars with the exception of maybe new york city is a real pain but yeah it definitely comes up with um trying to get to materials Um, I mean, I can't drive either. My joints of my sight and my hearing, it just all turns into a whole mess. But also, I live in a very rural village um, at the moment. I had to move out of the city to come back to my parents um, when I had to leave university at the beginning of the pandemic. And this is a rural village. We have no bus. We have no public transport. I have to have a... a a uh, wheelchair accessible vehicle to be driven by somebody which can have my powered chair in it um and so i have to have somebody who is willing and able to take me and i have the have to have the energy to get to a shop um and it's going to be a fairly long journey to get to any um shop so i'm almost always doing my shopping for pretty much everything online um which means that i'm then in a situation where i have sight issues and I also have sensory and tactile issues as well as dysautonomia. So my temperature regulation is gone. So I need to know what, what the fiber content is of your stuff. Cause if it's plastic, then I need to be knowing this is something that I can only use for things I'm going to wear occasionally or over a very short, small period of my area of my body, because I'm going to overheat in this, or I need to know, is this a really, really like rough textured fabric? is this thing a bright red color with like a deep red on it and i can't see both of those in this picture you've given me like little details please just have have really detailed descriptions of things texture what your fiber content is if you've got it like any patterns that might be difficult to see or colors that might be difficult to see on there stuff that can really affect my ability to buy stuff but I might not be able to necessarily see that or know that just from looking at the picture, especially with my poor eyesight and especially on sites that don't let you blow up the pictures. I mean, oh my God, it just turns into a whole mess. Um, there are so many websites that aren't even like basic levels of accessible and even just having the base thing of 
there is some decent description of what you're selling here makes a really big difference. In Australia, our main fabric and craft supplies chain is a company called Spotlight. And most of their stores, access is pretty good. Um, m m most of them are pretty good. I tend to have more issues with wheelchair access with the small independent stores, to be honest, um, who, because they're a small, small business, they don't necessarily look up Australian uh, standards and regulations on how much space should be in the walkway and how much you can crowd into a small space whereas big companies know the standards and work to them. Um, one thing that I do really like about Spotlight is that I can go on their website, find the item I want, and it will tell me with fairly reasonable accuracy whether they're in stock at my local store or if I need to go to a further store. And that means I can plan ahead so I'm after a particular pattern. I can find out if Spotlight has that pattern in stock already at my local store if I, or if I need to go to a different one. Or if it's listed as low stock, I might ring up the store in advance and say, it's listed as low stock. Can you double check that you do actually have one on the shelf? Um, so having stock numbers, and I recognise this is not always possible for small business, having stock amounts on the website it makes a big difference in me planning my journey and not over fatiguing myself. All right. Anyone else have any, any comments on this one? Any issues that they've come up? Um, I noticed for myself when I was a wheelchair user that most of the stores were very accessible in their hard fixtures, but they would put like end caps at the end of aisles and would that took up all the space that was legally regulated. So it'd be like those big cardboard displays or like things that intrude in on the aisle. Oh, we're just unpacking a bunch of boxes and they have like 10 boxes along the aisle. I'm like, well, I can't get past this. You better move it. And again, I'm horrible, so I'll tell people off. Um, but I was knocking into so many end caps for the you know months that I was in a wheelchair, knocking product over. It's like, just can you can you not? Like once you've met that space, you don't get to take it up. You're now in violation of the law. If you need 10 feet and you say, oh, well, we'll put an end cap on both space and they're both two feet wide. Well, now you've taken up all the space and you're no longer no longer in legal compliance. Like, I get you want to shove as much product in as possible. I get you want to sell as much as possible, but you still have to keep that space open according to the law, even though it's movable. Either you need to follow me around and move literally everything out of my way, or you're breaking the law. And I actually am so jealous of the stuff you have with the ADA because our stuff just isn't enforced in the UK. It's I'm, not enforced at all. I'm Canadian, so we're a little, a little better. Um, I... But yeah, it's, we have the Canadian Disabilities Act, I think it's called. Yeah, technically we have the Equality Act and um, all the stuff around that, but it just does not get enforced. The only way to enforce it is by taking somebody to court. Yeah. Um, and there is no government situation to be able to report it. Nobody will come out and, and check it. So the only way to get a store to actually have a lift or not have all of their stock just blocking the aisles up to like only two feet of space is to go and take those people to court and for that you'd need money that a lot of disabled people don't have um seeing as our legal money. system has been systematically defunded in this country we kind of end up in a situation where there is no funding for us to take them to court and we also can't take this stuff to court because we can't afford it on our own and so none of it is ever enforced and laws don't really matter if they're not enforced yeah i will say running stock over is a very efficient way of getting them to not put stock there it is because actually they, i it, noticed this and yeah it's, it's it sounds terrible and i'm sure there's a small business owner the out there cringing but if you keep putting it there i'm sorry i'm a klutz i have adhd and impulse issues and i'm not that mobile I'm going to run into it. It's going to end up on the floor. And if it smashes, it ain't my fault. Sorry. You're going to take me to court now. And I'm going to prove that. You know what I mean? Like, 
now yeah someone anyway, just mentioned don't in the put comments it there i'm that gonna run it over I don't know if they were in the UK, but someone mentioned that they wrote to their member of parliament uh, when they had a disability access issue and the and the MP sorted it out for them. So Yeah, I, I live in a conservative area, oh, so sorry. anybody from the UK can kind of understand where I'm coming from with this. I have yeah. a very, very conservative MP, unfortunately, who, while they have supported some disability legislation, they don't actually seem to fully see us as people. So yeah. it's just a problem. That person may have been from Australia because, like the UK, our Disability Discrimination Act, um, the DDA, is we, we call it the lion with no teeth. It's like the only way to have it enforced is to sue. Um, and a big, big case recently was Austra Australia's biggest bank bought out a uh, new card machine that was just a complete flat screen with uh, buttons on the glass to press when you use your credit card which as you can imagine is no good for people with vision impairments because they can't see the buttons on the flat screen and it it took people suing the commonwealth bank to get that resolved and now the best we can get is they've uh, changed the software after a three-year court case so you can plug in headphones and it will read it to you yeah um but in, all, in most cases, the easiest way to get stuff changed in Australia is to write to your local member of parliament. And just the idea of the local politician sticking their nose in is enough to get most people to fix their act up. Yeah, uh, the person who made the comment just commented again. They said they are in the UK and their MP is conservative and still fix the issue for them. So maybe there's hope. Oh, there. wonderful. They are extremely lucky to have a good <laughs> conservative MP. I am... It's a rural area. 99% of the people here are elderly. Fair. And you'd think that they would want disability issues, yeah. sort of. But they seem to just want to suffer a lot of the time. I was about to say in the UK, usually if you can frame it as like an elderly care issue or an OAP issue, then you can kind of get it turned around. But oh, God. I, yeah. Did you see our COVID Sometimes. stuff? Yeah. They were they straight up were like, yeah. it's no, only I, to say people and old people who have died, UK, so it's so. fine. Yeah. We're expendable. It's yeah. fine. No one wants us around. And I was just there like, are you kidding me? Like, it's it's only the disabled people and old people. I'm like, you're conservative. Like, 90% of your base is the older people. Are you wanting to kill off all your voters? <laughs> but yes, it's just a whole thing. Fair. Well, there's such, yeah. a, there's such a huge problem with the issue of, um, like, this stuff being up to the discretion of some one individual in power. Like um, when I, you know, give my scathing critiques of Dickens management, one thing that came up is the whole reason I was able to participate is like, there's no formal accommodations within their organization. I was just lucky that the directors of both of my casts wanted to accommodate me. But the, if they hadn't wanted that, or if they'd been different people, if it had been different directors, they could have said, look, if you can't do this, this, and this, you can't be part of my cast. And that would have been that. Also, I totally forgot to mention this, but one of the most amazing things about COVID has been all the digital content. Oh my God, that has changed my life. Of I can see concerts now. I can participate in stuff like this, like all these events I couldn't go to. And please, everyone, keep live casting your events. Like so many of us can't attend in person for whatever reason, but having a live cast, even of just like, you know, your, your speakers or your, you know, kind of public events is so amazing. And I know so many people with disabilities. I have a couple of friends who have myelagic encephalomyelitis and they've been housebound. Literally, they have not left their house other than doctor's appointments for over two years now. And they said, yeah, and having all these things available to them online has just changed their lives. And please keep doing that, please. And I hope that Cozy will keep being a thing, but make online content, make all of your content available online. Sorry, V, you had something to say. Well, same with working from home. Like yes. with the, yes. I used to have a very, very physical day job. Um, I'm a hairdresser. I still sometimes work as a hairdresser, but that is very physically demanding. It puts a lot of strain on the body. And, but like with the degree, my health issues have gotten worse. It's like, I can't necessarily reliably go to a job where I have to leave my house. But if things like, if things stay work from home, it's like I could take an office job and work from bed 
if mm -hmm. I needed to, I could do that. And that's not something that would have been possible pre COVID. And now there are all of these offices that are like, Oh, well, if you're vaccinated, you have to come into the office again. And it's like, really, we spent two years setting up all of this infrastructure for people to work from home. And you're just gonna throw it all out the window. Yeah. Like how inefficient is that even if you take the idea of accessibility out of it, that's just such a waste. And they've I, I it really is slightly bitter that um, we have been trying for so long to get them to understand that this is needed. And as soon as all of the able-bodied people in the world needed it, suddenly it was possible. We've been told for years that it's impossible to do these jobs from home, that it was impossible to do all of this work, that it was impossible for us to access these events without having to physically be there. And suddenly, as soon as people who weren't disabled needed it, then it was suddenly a bit uh, able to be done. And so much of this stuff was stuff that didn't actually take much of a change. A lot of this stuff didn't require much in the way of extra software or extra work. They just didn't want to do it. And That's now enough. after they've set all that stuff up, as soon as able body people don't need it anymore, now they're like, yeah, but we don't want to keep doing that. And it's just, it's, it's the fact that it was so easy to do and they chose not to do it purely because they didn't need it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing is now that it's been done, one of the nice things is that has created a framework for people like us when they say this job cannot be done remotely. Now that it's been done remotely and you can just, <laughs> yeah, they have no legal grounds to say it cannot be done remotely anymore. So that's something to keep exactly. in mind is those accommodations and you don't have to disclose a disability at any point in your interviews. Once you've been made a job offer, say, I'd like these accommodations. If they say we can't do this as a work from home arrangement and they did it during COVID, that is enough grounds for them to be able to be mandated by law to do that. So please take that with you and like yeah. use that as a stick to beat them with. And also keep in mind that some employers can be magically fantastical. I work for the French school board and the French nonprofit daycare system in my town. And I have I was hired in a full position um, and then realized after I took it that I hadn't actually been on the floor with children for six to eight hours a day in years. And two months in was just not able to do it. So I went to kind of go and give my notice. I was crying. I loved working there. And she and my director was like, hang on, don't do anything permanent. Just and they came back with an offer of three hours a day to cover lunches and things because um, people who can speak French and have it, the their ACE are so in demand that they were like, what accommodations do you need? Let me find some. <laughs> and they've been really great since then. And I'm now working four hours a day because that gets me medical benefits. But they've been literally amazing anytime I've had to go to them. Even we were the last time we were in lockdown, they let me bring three kids with me to the thing I was doing, even though one of them is not legally my child and two of them don't go to that school district. So they do exist. They do exist. Yeah. And look for that in Fantastic. the job descriptions of we invite people of all you know abilities or whatever to apply. And some say we want you to disclose to us if you have, if you're LGBT, if you're a uh, person of color, all these kind of things. Because often, I mean, I work in the nonprofit world and most nonprofits get funding on that basis. And so you actually get to be the tick in the box, especially if you're like disabled and queer and a person of color and all these kind of things. And, and you see the HR people like tick, tick, tick. So <laughs> if, if they invite you to, it is a good idea to disclose. Um, just say you can just say I am a disabled person and you don't have to disclose anything more than that that's all you need to say um, but I'm gonna move us on a little bit because we've been here for a while and I'm gonna wrap up the last two questions in one of kind of what is your worst horror story as a disabled person and what is your uh, most wonderful story that's happened to you as a disabled person does anyone want to jump in with this one I, I have mine ready to go Okay, I'll, I'll jump in since no one's volunteering. Um, my disability happened from a car accident. I was in a really tr trigger warning on this one. I was in a very bad car accident and broke 19 bones and was left in a wheelchair for quite a while and then crutches and the cane and I'm still recovering. Um, I may never recover and I don't know. I 
at, shortly after the accident, when I was in my recovery, I got a job offer from an organization, a nonprofit, and they, I told them, you know, I'm happy to take this. The start date was like months from then. So I would be, you know, at home doing this and it was supposed to be a work from home job. And I said, sounds great. Just to let you know, uh, I was in a car accident and, you know, but since I'll be working from home, it won't be a problem. I just want you to know everything and blah, blah, blah. They rescinded the job offer. Uh, like uh, immediately they pulled it back. Um, and I ended up having to take to file a human rights complaint. Okay. We're getting the five minute warning again. So why don't we disconnect? I posted the new link in the discord chat. So why don't we all disconnect and reconnect, get that done as fast as possible. Be right back folks. Melissa, there's two of you. Yes, I know. I set it up on the wrong computer, so I have too many email accounts. <laughs> but it wouldn't let me give me access to my own call. So well, that's very silly of it. Just waiting for Sarah and Maya. But as, as they come, I'll finish off my story. Um, so yeah, they withdrew the job offer, and I ended up having to, to file a human rights complaint. And oh, one sec. Close the dialogue. Yeah, okay. I ended up having to file a human rights complaint against them and I won, but all I got was a cash payout. I did not get a job and that is very crappy. Um, I've had, I also was going to be in uh, an opera and when they found out, they immediately fired me. They said, we can't, we don't, we know you won't be able to do the dances. The show was eight months away and uh, I was one of the only actual dancers on the cast. If I can disconnect now. There we go. And despite being one of the only dancers on the cast, they said, we know you won't be able to do this. They knew nothing of my condition other than that I'd broken my legs. Um, but they said, we know you can't do this. And the worst part is the, we're doing this for you. We're looking out for your best interests. We, you know, we're just concerned. And we just, you know, want you to focus on your recovery. And I'm like, that is the most insulting, humiliating, paternalizing, like, I can't swear. Or wait, I have to turn captions back on. Like, I was so furious. I... Yeah, them, them telling me what I could and could not do was so insulting. It was so insulting. And I was just fuming mad and I called them on it they're like how do you know that I can't do it well we're concerned for you and we're we're making the best decision for you and I'm like no you're not you're, you don't know what the best decision is for me what the best decision is for me should be my decision and the interesting thing is I was supposed to be in another opera uh, only a few weeks after the accident and this is actually a disability-led opera company by the name of Opera Mariposa. They were going to let me do the show. They were going to find a way to get a wheelchair on stage and let me do the show. Um, and it was like, no, it's I'm, I'm in too much pain. I'm on too many opioids, uh, which do weird things to your diaphragm and singing voice, as it turns out. Um, and that's actually one of my really wonderful moments. And, you know, having people just... My best moment is just people inviting me to things 
they don't think about my disability. They don't say, oh, we're concerned about mm, maybe you can't. It's just, hey, you want to do this? And let me choose. Like, let me say, no, I can't. Or, you know, is there a way I can sit down on the sidelines or something? But when people just invite me, like without a preamble, without a whatever, and just say, we'd love you to come out. And, you know, I miss you. Let's go do something. You know, or, or even just, I was thinking of doing this. Are you able to do that? Yeah, I can totally do that. Great, let's go do that. And it's just a simple question, and that warms my heart. And we're inventive people. So if you if you say to us that something is happening and here's what's going on, this is why you're concerned, most of us have probably worked out various ways to do stuff similar to that or can at least think of a few ways to try because we spend half our lives going, okay, I need to get that plate. It's a little bit too high. I'm sitting in my wheelchair can I get myself transferred onto the arm of my chair so I can reach that? You know, like we spend half our time finding inventive ways to do stuff in a world that's built for people who are completely different to us. And the idea that we wouldn't be able to work out a way to do something we want to do without hurting ourselves is just insane. Yeah, there's um, this idea that I talk about with it's just like, well, just let disabled people do things. Like sometimes I will decide to do something that I know is going to be really, really hard on me. Like it's going to trigger my fibro or I'm going to be exhausted the next day. And like, I can make that decision if I want to. But also I would love it if other people didn't make it unnecessarily difficult. If I decide that like, oh yeah, this event involves a ton of walking around outside. I could like, just tell me that and I'll decide whether I want to do that. Um, the flip side of that is, I mean, obviously, please don't put disabled people in the position of having to say, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. No, I can't do that over and over and over. <laughs> like, it, yeah. would, it would be great, especially if you spend a lot of time around us to to at least make some effort of remembering, like, what our, our, our specific set of things we can or cannot do are. And what's um, your best it, story? Does... Sorry. Okay. Well, um, so I can give the horror story, actually. Um, the best story is not one that's related to costuming, but I can give the horror story. And um, of course, to go off at Dickens again, and in particular, to go off at some specific individuals in their costume shop. Um, so I was doing my season with them in 2019, and participants are expected to provide their own costumes. There's no stipend for this. If the costume shop has to do anything for you, you pay them, despite the fact that you're performing with for them and they wouldn't have an event without you. Um, so anyways, I had bought this corset and it wasn't a good fit for me. And despite being a like decently made corset, like there was nothing wrong with it as a corset, it caused me back spasms. And I'm talking that like the level of pain where I'm sort of on the edge of that, like I can't string two thoughts together. I can barely speak in complete sentences. And I brought it to the costume shop and I was like, okay, here's, here's my medical situation. Is there anything you can do for me with this corset? What would you recommend? And the person there is like, oh, well, my, my wife has stuff like that going on. Um, let me take this corset for you. I will see what I can do with it. This is what the costume shop bills per hour. This is how long I think it's going to take me. Can you afford that? And I said, okay, the number you just told me is a stretch, but I'm in a lot of pain and I don't know how to fix this myself. And I've already signed on for the season. So I guess I'm going to have to make it work. And so he takes the corset, puts in half again as many billable hours into it that I now owe him money for. And it's still, like, I'm still in pain. Like, the, the corset has not ceased to cause me problems. No other solutions are offered. And then this dude says to me, by the way, you have a very interesting body for me. Would you come in like after your next day of performances so I can like take a full asymmetrical body block for you? Like that sounds like it would be a really interesting thing to do. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, you what? And you haven't even made my corset stop hurting me? Like it is just because you're not objectifying somebody because you're attracted to them doesn't mean you're not objectifying somebody. And like, you want me to come in after a day of performing where I'm in pain because of this corset that you did not make me less painful for me. So you can have fun with my asymmetry. Wouldn't it have helped if you had done the body block before editing your corset? Yes, yes, it might have. It might have. Like, surely he could have gotten his rocks off 
and also helped you if he'd just done that first. Yeah, like, and, and the thing is, like, I showed up and he took all the measurements and I never, like, one of the things he said is like, oh, well, if you do this, if, if you, like, come and stand for me and let me measure you, I'll give you the block. I never got the block. No effort was made to get me the block. Ugh. I wouldn't have particularly wanted to hear from him at that point, but it, it didn't happen. Well, um, sort of, I guess, the best story I have is not particularly related to costuming, but I have um, one friend in particular who um, just is is like my my sort of shining example of how to be an emotional or otherwise support human for somebody with a disability. She just she does a really good job of not putting me in those situations where it's like, well, I I'm gonna have to like make everybody slow down. It's like she's known me for a decent amount of time and she remembers, okay, like V can, is fine to do this, fine to do this, fine to do this. This is a problem. This is a problem. And she's just not going to ask me to like go on a gigantic hike with her or something like that so that's kind of like what i would love to see from people it's like if you're going to be going to an event and there is somebody you know with a disability just like make some effort to have a good idea in your head of what's going on even if it means you need to talk to them beforehand even if it means you need to write it down like what whatever whatever enables you to be that person for them it makes a huge difference Totally. All right. Who'd like to go next? Mm. Maya, we I haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> so my best story and my worst story are a little bit intertwined. Um, my worst story, uh, when I was in high school, I worked in a costuming shop. And I also, whenever they needed someone to fill in, I would fill in as an actor, as a chorus line girl, you know, whatever. And... Um, I had a partner dance and this person could not accommodate me just existing. <laughs> um, he would rotate my joints too much and like pop things out of socket and then lift me by that limb. Um, and the very, very last night, he injured me every night that we performed, but the last night of the performance, he, um, it was supposed to be a prat fall, right? He was supposed to sidestep. It would look like he had shoved me and I would fall, right? The last night of the performance, he full force just shoves me to the ground, right? I split my gluteus minimus in between the stage floor and my pelvic bone, and that is where my limp came from. Uh, this story actually has a really happy ending, though, but it gets really, like, crummy for a minute, so bear with me. <laughs> Um, I live in a very small town and this theater was in this small town and, you know, I have a limp now and everyone knows that I have a limp now. And, you know, I'm not shy. I tell the story of what happened. And 90% of the time people are like, oh, no, I know that actor. He's awesome. He's great. It had to be an accident. There's no way that he would do that to you. Right now, 4th of July, two years ago, my limp is acting up. I'm in a crummy mood, a really, really crummy mood. And there is this like six foot tall, ginger, incredibly attractive man. And I never do this, but for some reason, I just vent the whole story to him beginning to end. And I, I say the guy's name, which again, I never do because I know what the reaction will be. People will be like, oh no, he's great. I know him. And the guy goes, wait. And he repeats the name back to me. And he's like, that's the person that did this. And I was like, yeah, that's the person who did it. And he was like, oh, he's like my oldest friend. I grew up with him. And I was like, oh. Um, to sum the story up really, really quickly, the man that I told this story to on 4th of July is now my husband. He confronted the man who did this to me very, very intensely. Um, and we are now married and very happy. Well, that, that's uh, adorable. I'm sorry you limp, limp but, but I'm glad you got a husband out of it. Good. So Sarah, sorry, you wanted to go next? No, I actually wanted to say that I think I kind of already gave both my worst and my okay. best in the course of this. My best is obviously my employer who I will never stop going on about. They're literally fantastic. And my worst before this was literally just having to walk back and forth at camping things, but then I went to the Citadel this week and they win the prize. Fair enough. Okay, so who wants to go next? Isolde? Um, I have an absolutely wonderful local chapter of the SCA that, f 
for many years, whenever I needed anything, someone would jump up and help me. I mean, sure, I might have felt guilty that I was accepting all this assistance and couldn't always give it back to the SCA, but I learnt to accept it. And now I can actually physically pay someone. I feel far less guilty because it changes the dynamic from me accepting charity to be a more equal, well, I'm giving you something in exchange for your services, even if it's money and it comes from the government. I'm doing it. But I think the thing that has changed my costume participating more than anything in the world has been, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <laughs> I picked up conjunctivitis from my students at school. So I'm all gunky around here. Um, the thing that has changed my participation in costuming and events more than anything has been adequate government funding support it has bought me equipment support services my support worker cook uh, does bulk cooking for me once a week so when i come home from work i can rest instead of forcing myself to cook and clean uh i don't need to worry about vacuuming my sewing room when all the bits of cloth and thread are on the floor because my support worker will do it for me if things get so overwhelming um untidy someone can help me clean um my electric scooter cl that clamps onto the front of my wheelchair lets me go over land and over the uneven grass at events support workers to set up my camp so i'm not exhausting myself before event has even started it has australia's national disability insurance scheme which is still new and I will be the first to say it is an absolute bureaucratic mess. And what we're finding is that people who live in wealthier areas are getting much higher funding packages because they can, uh, when you start out, you can afford more uh, therapists and better therapy reports. Um, and the government recognise this isn't trying to fix it, but they're trying to fix it all in all the wrong ways by making pre-made plans that, your tick boxes match up so the current government's trying to destroy all the best things about the scheme without fixing the negative sides but i must say it has changed my life both in my professional and personal but also in my hobbies and thankfully the ndis is not means tested so no matter how much money I earn or don't earn, it's not going to affect my funding support because the disability pension, which is a welfare payment, is different from the NDIS, which is an insurance scheme. So you could be the richest person in town, but if you have a disability, the government recognises that you're paying more to live a life like everyone else because of your disability. So adequate government support that is not tied to income, it has been the most incredible benefit to disability and costuming. And I just pray that more and more countries, both um, uh, Western and developing nations, um, can replicate. And it's not cheap. The NDIS is a multi-billion dollar scheme. It is very expensive, but it's also driven up uh, employment massively because suddenly we can all afford to employ people. Um, a lot of my employees and support workers are disabled themselves and a good friend within the SCA between a car accident and chronic health, pain, health problems, she'd given up on work on on the possibility of ever working again um she was one of my first support workers and she's found so much purpose in working for me and other people um in my sca group so um she's not with me anymore she works with someone who lives a bit closer to her but a lot of people who haven't worked in a long time are getting work through the ndis because of the government so it, it makes sense from an economic standpoint but also a social participation standpoint. And I'm rambling because NDIS is amazing and the government shouldn't cut it and screw it. It's all good. It sounds great. The people in the comments are loving it too. Uh, Violet, you're, you're up next. 
Um, just a brief thing of like, yeah, I agree with you that carers are absolutely wonderful. Um, I saw the like once once i've got a good carer like they do become kind of like part of your family especially i need help with showering and everything like that like basic health needs basic like living stuff and so um i would be pretty useless if i didn't have care stuff but the um the means tested part of it here does make it a little bit more difficult um but uh the um the, I've had big issues with educational services when it comes to um, my health. Um, I'm not going to go into the university stuff. There's a whole mess there, and I'm not supposed to talk about the details of that. Um, but if I'm talking about specifically like state schooling, um, so the stuff that's like run by local authorities and like funded by that, I would I had had to leave. I'd gone to boarding school when I was. Um, 11 on a scholarship and I'd had to leave because I essentially had a complete mental breakdown and then had a psychotic break and was not well enough to be at boarding school um and we tried to get me to have the year delayed because I was in my GCSE year which is our big exams when we're 16 um and even though I was very intelligent and probably didn't necessarily need the whole year to catch up with all the work I would miss, um, the fact that I would be missing an entire year of schooling was obviously going to affect my grades in those exams at the end of the year. And also the fact that I couldn't leave my house because of really severe anxiety and agoraphobia at the time. Um, And the school board, the like education board in the area said that I couldn't that if I had had cancer or broken both my legs, then that would have been fine. I could have missed that year of school and been held back a year. But because it was a mental health issue that I wasn't allowed to, and I just had to deal with it. Um, so I missed an entire year of school and then went and did my exams after that. Luckily, I the reason I'd had that mental breakdown in the first place was because I was overworking myself with schoolwork. And so I was actually prepared enough to be able to do decently well in my GCSEs. But that was an absolute nightmare. Um, but actually I'd, I'd say that my, my big good ones have largely been weirdly little things. It's things like I was completely, um, freaking out on, um, like my health and my disability stuff and all of that sort of stuff. And the friends and family that actually stuck around there, it's, it's the whole thing but the friends and family that actually stuck around have been absolutely life-saving and um having good medications like i moved to this area and there are a ton of issues with this area but the big thing that has been such a big like change has been i actually have a gp that listens to me here and the difference now that i've got decent pain medication and like my health is working like is being worked on and people are actually listening to me when I say something's wrong here and not just dismissing it as oh it's probably just part of this or it's probably just growing pains which is a whole thing um means that my ability to cope with things and the number of autistic meltdowns that I have has massively reduced because it turned out that being who knew being in tons of pain all the time doesn't help with sensory issues and meltdowns. And so every time I got a little bit stressed, I was just bursting into tears, freaking out, couldn't do anything. And then suddenly having pain medication that reduces that pain and actually resting and having people help me do stuff, like massive difference. So it re- it really is the little things. It's just, you know, if I'm stressing and struggling at a particular place, um having a quiet place or having people let me take that time out makes that big difference it really does yeah um i suppose i should also give heads up i live in a shared household so i have me and my three kids live here with my best friend her husband her two kids a dog and a lizard um but they them living here honestly makes it possible for me to have my children full time and because i don't have the kind of government backing that would get me a carer or get me, but I do have two other adults in the house, which means if I have a migraine, if I need to go lay down, if I need to, I'm not dropping everything onto my children to look after themselves. I have other adults who are going, 
okay, you're out for the night. Okay. They've fed the children. They've put them to bed. They've been cared for in the family that we live in. And I get a lot of comments of people who say, oh, I couldn't share a house like that, but honestly don't know what I would do if I was living in a situation where I wasn't. Yeah. So hats awesome. off to my best friend and her husband for keeping us here. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is such a thing. There's a lot of ways in which that ability to like um, do stuff communally makes a big difference. And I think I'm I'm feeling that a lot because I don't have that right now. Yeah, but it is such a thing. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. So I'm gonna open the floor to questions. I know we had one a while back that we hung on to, and it was. What are some standard adjustments you have found for costumes? And for me, it is flat shoes and no floor length dresses because my cane catches on them and then I fall on my face. Um, for me, it's it's shortening. Like you have got to shorten skirts and um, even trouser legs and things like that. Things have got to be shortened at the bottom because otherwise they'll catch on your wheels. Uh, when I was in a manual chair, uh, you've got to make sure that you have don't have big drapey sleeves or anything because that used to get caught in my spokes all the time. Um, and then if you are somebody who's sitting down all the time, you need to make the back of your stuff slightly longer. So any skirts or trousers, or even if you're just do if you're doing a dress, you need to make that back part of the torso a bit longer because it actually will be slightly longer when you're sitting down because that curve it needs to go around. And you don't want something fitting you badly when you are sitting all day in it. So it's just adjusting it to how your body changes when you're sitting all the time. Um, some of the ones that I tend to do for like the, the pressure sensitivity, um, obviously there's the just sort of like altering things to actually fit the ways in which my body is asymmetrical. But also um, I try to make sure that anytime I'm gonna wear something, um, if there's a lot of weight or a lot of pressure or a lot of compression, it's very distributed. So like my corset, it, it doesn't just fit at the waist and it's just touching me here and just touching me at my low hip. It's like similar amount of compression throughout the whole thing. My shoulder straps don't dig in. They're carefully put at a point on my shoulders where they don't cut in. And same thing, like if I'm wearing a big, heavy skirt, um, yes, the waistband is fitted, but I will, I will like hook straps over my shoulders. So I'm carrying that weight at more points on my body. Um, I've made types of skirt supports specifically, and I'm actually planning on doing another one soon that are very low in weight. So I'm not adding to the amount of, of weight bearing I have to do other than just carrying my own body around and, and fatiguing myself further. Sure. I'm actually the perfect opposite of that. I anchor everything to my waist and I make sure that that's where all of the compression and the um, weight is going. Because if I anchor it to my hips, you know, that's going to agitate my limp. And if I anchor it to my shoulders, that's going to hurt everything here. And if I anchor it to my chest, well, I've never actually tried that. I think it would look <laughs> odd. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I'm the same in that I really have to avoid the compressing anything on my shoulders. I don't wear backpacks. I don't carry things there. Um, my I have straps on my 18th century stays, but they're literally decorative and they float above my shoulders because I can't have, it's actually, I find really nice to wear a Victorian corset with no straps because bras have straps that can bug me. So sometimes I'm like, I want to dig out a corset and put it on and not have shoulders for a while. Fair. And the next question is, I love this one. Have you ever attempted decorating your mobility aids? And I can say, I actually have one right here. <laughs> I, when I went, switched to a single point cane, I bought one that was historical looking so that it would just kind of blend in. And I hate medical looking devices. They're awful, um, like all the plain silver or painted black. So I got this with a solid brass head and it is a rated mobility cane, but I can wear it with my normal clothes and it looks looks very vintage. It could fit in like dozens of different eras. I know, Isolde, you had one too. Um, early in my SCA career, if you want to put that, when I first started using crutches, everyone commented, oh, you, you should make nice wooden one, w wooden crutches. And I went, sure, that's a great idea. That would look amazing. And one of the guys at S SCA helped me do just that. 
unfortunately, the uh, wood on one of the cuffs, it just couldn't stand up to the beating I was giving it. And unfortunately, it split within uh, a few months after that. Um, and look, they look great. But since then, I've come more full circle. And people t keep telling me so, uh, when I've got um, the front, my freewheel attached to the front of my chair, oh, you should put a swan head on the front of that because in my my state, um, our symbol is the black swan because it's on the Swan River. It's native to our region. And but I've actually come along as like no why 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 do I need to cover it up? As I, I've gone from thinking oh that could look really cool to be incorporated to I can't be bothered doing that stuff. I really can't. And um, I'll show you a photo just a moment of what my wheelchair looks like if I can. Here it is. Um. So you would have, most people would have seen this image on an icon, but here's it nice and large once I switch over window. You need to present as well. Yeah, there we are. So the, this is my wheelchair, and check out those wheels. It's beautiful Australian wildflowers. I freaking love it. I've only had this wheelchair for a uh, few months now um, and I'm loving the wildflowers. I don't want to change it up to wooden boards to make it look more medieval. I want to show off my wildflowers. Awesome. They're beautiful. Anyone, anyone else? I mean, my previous wheelchair, my current one is a powered chair and they're super expensive. So that one's technically NHS owned. I'm just loaning it and so I can't do anything drastic to it. Uh, but my previous wheelchair had power-assisted wheels. I just can't use it anymore because I dislocate my um, elbows too often. And it was bright purple, like an actual violet colour. Um, and I absolutely loved that. That was great. And then obviously I had um, handles that could be put down so nobody could grab them. Because, my God, the number of people that grab you just randomly. Um, and, like, I... I had an underseat bag. I did, a lot of the stuff I do to my mobility aids is um, to do with like making it more useful for me. So I have hooks like you would put onto the back of um, push chairs on there, the little carabiner hooks with the um, Velcro around it. I bought some that are used for push chairs. I've just got it on the bar on the back of my powered chair. And so I can just hook bags onto that. Like nine times out of 10, if I'm adapting if I'm changing something with my mobility aid, it's because I want it to do something that it doesn't already do, like carry my bags for me in a way that I don't have to keep on like readjusting it or um, we'll hook a, an ankle light that runners use onto the back of it sometimes if I'm going out when it's nighttime so that cars can see me better and stuff like that. It's just making it better for me so that... If I want to go out and get a few things at a shop, I can carry that without having to have something on my lap so I can't move too much or I mean to constantly readjust it and making it so that most people don't want to hit a powered chair. It will really fuck up their car. But even if it's nighttime and I've got a black wheelchair, so just having a a single like light on it just makes it a little bit easier for people to notice me. It would also really mess up your insurance because those things are expensive. Yep. Yeah. The, the one thing I'm going to add to that is don't touch disabled people. Don't touch their mobility aids. Even if you think, unless they are literally about to die, like if they're walking out into traffic and they're about to if hit I someone. Ask you, it's different. Yeah. If, if you're yeah. literally about to walk onto train tracks and there is train coming that's the only exception. But please but, do if that happens. Yeah, I've had the exact yeah. opposite yeah. where I've been trying yeah. to get up into Staples and nearly tipped over backwards and had a guy go, should I help? Which, I mean, I appreciate like, the yes. question, but I'm about to crack my head open on the pavement, so could you grab the other end, please? Yeah, and don't it touch our like mobility aids ever. You, you touching my cane or moving it is the equivalent of me taking your leg off and walking away with it. You don't touch a wheelchair, don't push somebody unless they explicitly ask you to. 
The like, amount of times I've had to explain to somebody that if they wouldn't just pick up some random person and carry them somewhere just without asking them, that they shouldn't be pushing my wheelchair without my permission. Yeah, my friend, is insane. my friend who's visually impaired and she has no vision says this happens to her like once a week, people will grab her and like drag her across the street. And she doesn't know who they are. She doesn't know what's going on. It is a day, not daily, but it's an incredibly regular occurrence. And she's like, well, now I literally don't know where I am because I locate based on the exact route I travel and counting steps and everything. Don't touch people. Just don't touch disabled people. Don't touch their equipment. Don't touch their mobility aids ever and on that like, yeah. treat them I, like the real people and ask what they need yes mm -hmm. can i help you no okay great thanks the end like if yeah. you're not picking up, you? Yes, like, carrying you this bloody ramp. yeah yeah if you're not picking up and carrying random people yeah without their permission you shouldn't be pushing us around exactly and like moving our mobility aids or like doing stuff like that you you need to be asking us just like you would ask any other person if you were going to be touching mm -hmm. them like that you know? so, so I am going to start wrapping this up because we have been here for two hours and that's a long time. And I know we have people with like some bad pain flare ups <laughs> who are not doing well. And I so appreciate you guys being here. It has been wonderful. It's past my bedtime. I know it's way past it. your bedtime. Thank you. <laughs> so just the few, the few housekeeping things is the link to the cozy playlist is in the description. Some people asked about sewing tools and supplies. I made a list. We all curated our favorite sewing tools and supplies, and they are in the description with links to purchase. Um, they are affiliate links, full disclosure, and any money that's raised through that or the Kofi will be split amongst all the panelists. The and I did a video yesterday on that same topic yeah, for stuff I that I that. use. So the links to everybody's channels are in the description as well. Please go like and follow everybody. Please like and follow me. Please comment. There was so much great stuff happening in the chat. There was links to like, here's how to access this thing. Here's a petition to get more accessibility. I know there's a Discord server for makers with dis disability. Please post all of those in the comments. Please share your experiences. Ask any questions you have that we didn't get to. I'm sure we'll all be watching the comments for that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like and subscribe in the morning. Yeah, like and subscribe to everybody. Go watch all the cozy links. Go watch everybody else's videos. Also, if you are a badge collector, we do have a badge for this panel. I was going to post it as a QR code, but weird live streaming things. Um, so the link for the badge is also in the description. So go click on that and you can get your accessibility badge. <laughs> And I'm the badge fairy for and, that one. So and I'll Maya, be assigning it to you. And Maya is the badge fairy. <laughs> And join the Discord for chatting with everybody else. We're, we're having secret hidden badges being sprinkled on through, which I've been busily at. So yes. you should go check it out. There's a public cozy Discord, so go join that, as well as if somebody could post the disability Discord uh, in the comments, that would be great, assuming that it's open to everybody. So it's basically disabled makers. So go join that one as well. Mm -hmm. It is very lovely. I didn't know about the hidden ones on Discord. I wonder there if are. there's an SDA one because there's enough Skadians in there, there I must say. Talk, I, there might be. I don't know. We have a lot of Skadians there. But yeah, thank you everybody so much for <laughs> attending. I know some of you are having a rough day and it's meant the world to me to have you all here. It's been so much fun hanging out with everybody and with all the lovely people in the comments and in the chat. It's been so much fun. So hope you all have a wonderful day. I'm wishing you all of the spoons in the world. Stay happy and healthy. Take care of each other. And until then, bye. <laughs>